My name is Patrick, and I'm here with Amata to present our investigation that we call Magniburst Missteps, because even spiders can trip over their own web. Uh, this is an investigation conducted by three security analysts from Entity Security Holdings, uh, which includes Amata, myself, and our colleague Kim, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. <clears throat> In this talk, we will first uh, go over with a brief overview of what, uh, who Magniburst is and what they've done. Uh, after that, we'll take you on a journey of some misconfigured servers that we found and what some of the mistakes this group has made can teach us about how they operate. At the end, we'll have a Q&A session. <clears throat> so who is Magniburst? Uh, Magniburst is a ransomware gang that's been operating since 2017. Uh, they tend to target East Asian countries, primarily Taiwan and South Korea. And we know that they use uh, sophisticated techniques to deliver their ransomware to victims. They constantly jump on the latest vulnerabilities. And in the past year alone, researchers have discovered two zero-day vulnerabilities in Microsoft's smart screen by analyzing Magniburst payloads. Earlier this year, we heard that the group was targeting European countries, and that's when they really caught our attention and we kicked off this investigation. So at the start of our investigation, we wanted to figure out uh, what infrastructure this group had set up. <clears throat> we started from a web server that we knew was set up by Magnibur, and we looked at how it uh, responded to requests, what HTTP response headers it set, and in what order, to build a form of fingerprint of how the server was configured. And we fed this fingerprint into Showdown and found over 400 web servers configured in a similar way. And when we took a, look, a closer look at these hosts and what other host services they were exposing, uh, we found something pretty interesting. So in the red box here, you can see some PHP code. And as you know, PHP is a server-side language. It should never be visible to a client. So something clearly went wrong when they set up this server. We could also see that the majority of those servers were rented through a hosting provider called MyHosty. And this is a hosting provider that accepts Bitcoin payments, which makes them a pretty convenient choice for a ransomware group that's extorting people for Bitcoin. So let's dive into this PHP script that we found. Uh, when we started analyzing it, we found that it's used to deliver the Magnabar ransomware to victims. And there's a lot of juicy details to unravel here, but for the sake of time, we will choose the things that we found most interesting. Uh, the first thing we could see is that it uh, delivers MSI payloads stored in this folder here. Uh, but more than that, the exact payload delivered is selected based on the current time. So every 15 minutes, they rotate to a different payload. We also found a list of 12 domains that the server expects to find in the host header of your request. And if we take a look at this if statement, we can basically see that each domain is active uh, for two hours at a time. So the first domain is active from midnight till 2 AM, and then the next domain kicks in, and so forth. And when we came back to this server the next day, we could see that this list of domains had changed. And we figured they're probably doing this to try to outpace domain-based signatures, but possibly also as an anti-analysis measure. So Consider someone like us, a SOC analyst, finds a URL in a log file somewhere, and they go to investigate it. If they're two hours too late, then they wouldn't get any payload back to analyze. <clears throat> it's also clear that the group has come up with a sort of domain generation algorithm. Uh, they generate two random English words and register that as a .email domain. And we started thinking about how we could identify these domains before they're used to deliver ransomware. And it turns out uh, we can, because they use a pretty unique combination of top-level domain, register, and hosting provider. So here we see a sample of domains registered on two separate days in February this year. And if we take a closer look at the timestamps when they were registered, it's pretty clear that they've uh, automated this process. All 12 domains are registered in the span of 10 seconds. And they also tend to use the register name silo, which just like the hosting provider accepts Bitcoin payments. 
The script also has filters to ensure that the ransomware is only delivered to its intended victims. One such filter is a list of allowed countries that are, uh, yeah, countries that are allowed to download the payload. In January, we could see that they were targeting European countries, but then in February, they zoned in on South Korea and Taiwan instead. There are also filters to ensure, uh, to make it harder for an analyst to grab a payload. For instance, they perform a reverse DNS lookup on your IP, and they match that host name against known security vendors. Uh, for instance, Anlab, who's done a plenty of research into this group in the past. Uh, they check your user agent to see if your browser looks legitimate, but also if your operating system could actually run the ransomware if you downloaded it. Uh, they check your referrer and so on. There's also this list of block countries that are not allowed to download the payload. And interestingly, uh, most of these countries are part of or have been part of the Commonwealth of Independent States. We can see the payload names they were using at this time. This was back in January. Uh, and more than that, we can see a bunch of commented payload names that they've used in the past. And it's, yeah, it might be hard to read, but it's clear that they tend to masquerade as uh, software updates uh, with the occasional outlier like COVID warning readme or error software log. And it's clear that they've used this script for quite some time and then just make minor changes to it as they go. We tried to figure out how long they've been using the script. And to answer that, we went back to Shodan. Shodan has a feature called Trends, where you can give it a query, and you get back a timeline, a month-by-month -month breakdown of how many hosts matched that query at a given point in time. And for this query, we wanted to use a unique keyword that would only match on this PHP script. And well, we thought we found a pretty good candidate for that. Uh, and yeah, we get a timeline that stretches back all the way to 2019. So for over four years, this actor has been using this or variations of this script. And for the same amount of time, they've struggled to configure Apache to actually run PHP. The final thing we want to mention from the script is that we found two hosts that are excluded from the anti-analysis filters. And we figure that these hosts are likely used by the threat actor to sort of debug their own infrastructure, to download test payloads, but they might also be sitting on these hosts and managing their infrastructure at large. So we decided to call them jump hosts. And yeah, let's take a step back from the PHP script. Uh, we found 300 hosts that we believe belong to the actor, hosting over 400 web servers. Out of these, around 80 are misconfigured, spitting out the PHP code uh, script. And we can see that they're used to deliver the Magnum ransomware. We also found two jump posts uh, based on the contents of the PHP script. But yeah, the hunt didn't end here. So I'll hand over to Amata to present the rest of our findings. Thank you, Patrick, and hi, everyone. So as Patrick mentioned, we found over 400 services belong to Magnum ransomware gang. Out of those services, one particular host stood out as a black sheep, as it had port 8080 open. In our line of work, we tend to look for abnormal or suspicious activity, and these hosts look very really suspicious to us. So we decided to take a look. To our surprise, it's exposing log file, revealing very juicy information. Before talking about the log file we found, we have to discuss about multiple ransom site. This screenshot is taken from a multiple ransom site. As you could see, it's called My Decryptor. Uh, the ransom site offer different features, such as the victim can upload one file for free decryption, and also a chat support where victim can get in touch with the ransomware gang uh, if support needed. We have seen in multiple cases where victim reach out and ask for ransom discount to our surprise, the threat actor was kind enough and gave out 15% discount to a victim. Uh, back to the log files. The log file contain activity toward my decryptor or the ransom site that we just discussed about. The threat, threat actor divide log file in six categories. 
Uh, due to the, the limit of time, we're just going to talk about the most important one, which is the one marked in red. The pre run provides uh, insight into how many victims have been infected with this ransomware. And the second one is the get decrypt. The get decrypt is locked every time someone downloading a decrypt. For, uh, for someone to be able to download a decrypt, they have to for the ransom. So this graph shows a daily count of newly infected victims over the past six months uh, with a peak of 1,200 victims. We found two log server over the past six months. The first one marked in blue, and the second one orange. Uh, as you can see, the first log server was active between February to April before they migrating to the second log server. Over 89,000 victims victim were observed. 99% of the victims were located in Korea and Taiwan. So if you guys recall the jump holes that Patrick was mentioned about, one of the jump holes was observed in the log files as a victim. So it's kind of proof that a uh, threat actor was using the jump holes to test if the ransomware or the infrastructure is work as intended. Analysis of the get decrypt type in combination of the uh, Bitcoin payment on the ransom side show that a the threat actor has extorted approximately 16 Bitcoin over the past six months, which is equivalent to 450,000 US dollar. An update on our uh, the magnable ransomware infrastructure. On the top left, you have we have uh, on the left side we have 300 server. Out of those server, there are the log server with the port 8080 open, which we just discussed about. And then we have my decryptor next to it, the ransom side. On the bottom side, we have ransomware delivery uh, with the exposed PHP script. Lastly, we have the jump host. Hello. Uh, so uh, the hunt did not end there either. Uh, so our discovery of this log host showed that make a step, take a step back and take a closer look into it because it feels like this is one of the critical infrastructure belong to Magnimo Ransomware Gang. And to our surprise, they're exposing uh, it's a private key. Uh, to understand the impact of this discovery, we have to first talk about how the encryption of Magnimo Ransomware works. So let's get started. On the left side, we have Magnable Ransomware called Locker.msi. Inside the ransomware itself contain RSA, RSA public key. So when ransomware executed, it generate random AES key, which is used to encrypt the victim files. After that, if you use the public key to encrypt the random generated key, which is become this orange key and then append the key on to the end of each encrypted file. So to recover the files, we just need to uh, reverse. reverse this process. Exactly. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, utilizing the private key we obtain from the, the exposing to the internet. So yeah. Let's get started. We have the private key. We use that to decrypt the encrypted AES key to get the original key. Use that to decrypt the files and voila. Uh, yeah, we successfully recovered the files. We also created a proof of concept of a decryptor. In this recorded demo, you will see a web page where victims can upload their encrypted files. The server will then check if we have the private key. If so, the server will generate a decryptor and victim can then download the file to recover this, recover their system. So let's have a look. Victim can then drag and drop the encrypted files on the server. In this case, 
uh, luckily we have a private key, download um, and then download the decryptor, have to run it as admin, of course they have to trust us, we are a good guy here. Uh, and uh, select the directory that they want to recover the files. Small text, but uh, what it said is it successfully recovered two files, one of which is this beautiful PDF over here. So our question is how many victims could be decrypted? Based on the information on the PHP script that we found a different ransomware or the different payloads is delivered to victim in each 15 minutes. The exposed log show that six victim, uh, there's six new victims infected by this ransomware in each 15 minute interval. Adding those two factors together, uh, one key should roughly be able to decrypt six victims. On a peak, one key can decrypt uh, 30 victims. The problem is the private key only exposed when someone paid for the ransom, which means that someone somewhere in the world will have to suffer for six or 30 people to utilize this private key that we obtained. So far, we collected 177 keys. As you might already know, NTT is tier one network provider. This picture show uh, our cable across the globe. It is estimated that 40% of world's network is routed to our backbone. So as part of NTT group, we can derive threat intelligence data from NTT companies. In this case, we start analyzing net flow sample on the two jump holes. So what we found out was the jump holes was communicating to Bitcoin nodes. Uh, is it possible that they're using the jump holes to check if ransom have been paid or maybe even paying for the infrastructure? because they have like a 300 server that have to be paid on, uh, by Bitcoin and also 12 domain that they renew daily. Uh, we also observe traffic to our Jabber server. Jabber is messaging service. It is possible that they come, the support chat on the ransom site is route through the jump holes. The spider web, so let's put everything together. Uh, on the left side, we have Victims, we know for sure that victim download ransomware from the ransomware delivery server, which exposed PHP script. Based on the information on the exposed log, we know that the jump host uh, is downloading ransomware from ransomware delivery server. Uh, Net for sample showed that the jump host also communicating with uh, Bitcoin nodes likely using for making and verifying Bitcoin transaction. On the bottom here, we have my decryptor, uh, my decryptor or the ransom site. Uh, every activity to what my decryptor is locked on the locked server with exposing or oh, with port 8080 open. And we already know that the locked server not exposing lock is also exposing private key. On the right side, we have Magniba. Uh, the dotted line is something that is our assumption. Um, so somehow Magniba have to maintain or uh, maintain the log server and um, possibly send a message when they chat with the victim to the, to the Jabber server but it would be bad offset for them if they're communicating directly to, to the Jabber server. If Jabber server is compromised, then their identity might be compromised, so it would make more sense if they're sitting on the jump host and uh, communicate with the Jabber server from there, which add up with our uh, NetFlow sample that the jump host is communicating with Jabber server. So let's wrap everything up. Magnable ransomware have been in the ransom game for over many years. They seem to put a lot of effort into evading detection, such as generating 12 domain every year, uh, every day, sorry. Uh, over, over the past one year alone, they have been exploiting zero day vulnerability in Microsoft 
smart screen before the patch came out. But on another hand, they didn't seem to put a lot of effort on securing their infrastructure. As you can see throughout this presentation, we've seen multiple critical infrastructure uh, exposing to the internet. Moreover, they still didn't manage to set up uh, Apache correctly over the past four years, not exposing the PHP script. Approximately 89,000 victims have been observed in the six, over the past six months. They extorted 50, uh, 16 Bitcoin, roughly 450,000 US dollar. Uh, on this link, uh, we'll redirect you to our GitHub repo where we share the IOC, RSA private key, and also Bitcoin address where uh, the victim paid the ransom to the threat actor. Uh, our next step is uh, try to get in touch with uh, Europol. They have uh, the project called the No Ransomware Project. So hopefully we can get in touch with them and uh, give them the keys and do something good for the community. Uh, thank you so much and feel free to ask any questions.